Hello and good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you're watching. My name is Sean and you're watching Run 11 Live. Today, uh, tonight or today, we are going to be speaking to the automotive tuning legend that is RJ Devera. I see that RJ is online and he's asking to link up, so I'll bring him in in a moment. Just before we do, uh, remember your questions, please add them to the bottom. If you notice on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little square with a question mark. Type them in there so I'll be able to put them up for everyone to see. Um, please keep uh, sending them in throughout our time and we'll do our best to answer all of them. Thank you so much. But before anything, I'm going to get the man of the hour, RJ, in. Got to be honest right now. So stoked to see him. So absolute fanboy. <laughs> hey, Sean, what's up, brother? Hey, man, how are you? Good. I love the stash, man. I feel like it's grown <laughs> even in the last time I've seen it. Yeah, this is the, the COVID-19 look. I'm trying to yeah, go yeah. For, for shabby chic, but I think <laughs> I'm in pushing more the shabby part. But uh, thank well, you so I much, I man. Don't, I don't know how you're keeping the sides. So, I mean, are you self-cutting? Because mine, I'm like, I'm ready to audition for BTS and be part of a K-pop band or something, you know? <laughs> It's man, getting so long. That look, though, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, more so in the early 2000s where it was like halfway down my face. And uh, it's gotten a little bit shorter as I've gotten older. But, you know, with the quarantine, unless you're going to cut your own hair. I think there's you know. almost a general acceptance now to kind of look a slightly disheveled. But, you know, I think uh, I see it often. I, I, my hair seems to be disappearing up here. So <laughs> this is no problem. Um, but your your hair and my beard, we would just to, to, you know take on the world and win. I think. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, thank you so much for coming on. Believe me. Oh, it's thanks an for having me. Honor to have you. Oh, anytime, man. Anytime. Um, for for those that 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 don't know you, uh, you know, which is going to be kind of strange because you dare I say it, you are the the architect of the tuning scene influencer model seeing as you kind of did it 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was before it was called Influencer, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Man. Um, so, so tell everyone who's watching, um, you know, uh, uh, how you started, how you got in and, and yeah. the climb. So at the end of the day, I'm, I'm like most people that, that follow you and follow me. I'm just another guy that loves cars. Uh, I got brought into it to my older brother's friends. My older brother is about seven years older than me. And in the early, early 90s, I was taken to the local street races here in L.A. and kind of fell in love um, with all of that, you know. Um, and a lot of my brother's friends were, you know, tuning up backwards race cars, which were basically Hondas. So at the <laughs> age of uh, 15, I started buying parts for a car I didn't have. I actually got away from playing sports in high school and, and got a, a job uh, under the table and started buying parts. I mean, wheels and stereo systems were big back then. And that kind of kicked off. You had didn't you? I, I did. ADS, Nakamichi, uh, Fosgate was a big thing. I think my first car has le had like the, JB, the, the JBL kind of subs with the Fosgate amps. And then I went, I tried to go up market with a Nakamichi and ADS, which was super expensive. It cost like an arm and a leg. But yeah. at the time, the Craigslist, uh, there was a, a kind of like a want paper called the Recycler. And I'm sure all around the world, people had their own version of a newspaper version of the want ads. And the Recycler was kind of my, my things where like I would buy stuff and sell stuff. And, you know, I, I went through probably two car setups before I even had a car. And that's where it all started, you know. <laughs> Um, and then as soon as I got my car, even before I had my car, my mom had sold uh, my brother's car, which he wasn't the most enthused about, got him a station wagon because he was a DJ, uh, and then got me a, a, an Acura. Um, and so I modified that before even my 16th birthday. So it was pretty tricked out right around that time. You know, knowing that I, I didn't want to stop there, I, I worked at a local um, car store that really, at the end of the day, sold, sold car covers. Um, but I wanted to bring this like import performance side. So now I was about, I was 16 at the time and I'm 42 now. So 27 years ago. Um, and that's really how I got started. And then, um, you know, Super Street Magazine came around, right? As I got into college in 96, I became an editor there, paid my way through college with that, built a, a really good vast network. I was also entering a lot of car shows at the time. I uh, was importing parts from Japan. I mean, Fortuna. you know, 
uh, the Fast and Furious, of course, came around in 2000. I was a consultant on that, and that became a huge thing. Um, that became my life for about 10 years as a consultant for lots of different companies, either developing product or marketing their brand to this, this youth space back in the late 90s, early 2000s, mm. which then led me to uh, consulting for Meguiar's, which I've been for the last 10 years. So that's a yeah. really short recap of the last 27 years of my life. <laughs> it uh, is. Because cause you can't downplay an awful lot of stuff. And I, and I don't mean to blow smoke up your ass, man. This is not why I'm here. You know, uh, I, 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 think, I think you have a, such a fantastic story and, and so many lessons that can help other people who are either thinking or wondering what do they need to do to, 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 to achieve something, do you know? Um, yeah, I've been really lucky. I mean, I've, been, I've played in all sides of industries tied you know, all tied through the love for cars, um, from gaming, you know, working on Forza Motorsports to, you know, film and television with the, the movie and then the MTV show and then parts, you know, because at the end of the day, that's what we all love, right? As, as kind yeah. of aftermarket guys and, and um, you know, taking kind of a car that's perfectly good and normal and, um, you know, adding our own touch, <laughs> making it an extension of our personality is, is uh, the PC way to say it, but at the end of the day, we kind of F them up, right? Um, yeah, of course. Kind of make it all of our own, you know, because that's what's fun. And so yeah, that's probably the part of it that I enjoyed the most, but um, I have been really blessed to, um, to have worked and dabbled in all these different things that involve just the passion for cars and spreading kind of this love and passion for cars, you know? Um, yeah, I've, I, uh, when I look back at kind of my LinkedIn and then when I tell these stories, I'm like, wow, I've kind of been around the block a few times, you know? And I and I and I uh, and I still love it. I mean, this last SEMA was my 23rd SEMA in a row, and people were asking me like wow. if I was tired of it, and I was like, not at all. I was like more excited than I'd ever been. So, so yeah, I mean, feeling really blessed. It's a little bit of an odd year this year, and I'm wondering if this will, this will be the first SEMA since I turned 17 that I'll miss. Um, yeah. So, so we'll see. I mean, it's it's kind of looking like it, which would be sad, but it's pushing us to think differently about how we get out there, you know, I'm like, I can't wait till the day that we're all at cars and coffee events and, and we can kind of share this passion in person, but we're doing things like this, like IG live and, you know, Mercedes did like a, a Concord, the zoom the other day. And I know PCLA did a cars and coffee through IG stories the other day. So it's cool that people are doing whatever they can to continue this love that we have and to share it with other people and just to continue to talk cars. Cause at the end of the day, it gets us through stuff, you know? No, that's it. You're right. I think um, we we as a community naturally want to do things as a community. So we, we're trying to do our best to reach out and, and as you say, these diff different uh, mediums. And I suppose, you know, we're fortunate that so many people are like myself and you are just willing to why, why not rather than why, you know, right, so many right. people that are very much like, um, uh, yeah, let's do it. Fuck it. You know, it's yeah. Fun. Well, I think um, that's what's one of the great joys about being a car enthusiast, right? There is this like, you know, NF mentality, NFG mentality, like, well, why not? You know, I mean, what do we got to lose, right? And um, I think that's why the different sides of car culture, whatever vehicle you're into, that's why it always kind of progresses forward, right? Because there's all these people that just want to break the rules. I mean, here in America, you know, stemming from the muscle car era and like J that James Dean mentality of like, F it, you know, let's just go do it. Um, to now, and now it's evolved around the world. And, and, you know, it's the great part about watching all the different movements and the different people who are pushing it forward, right? Um, that's what gets me excited, you know, going to event. I mean, Luft is a great example, like the last yes. time at Universal Studios. I mean, from a car show perspective, as someone that's been going for, to car shows for the last 25 years, it like really blew my mind, like what Jeff and, and Patrick and, and, um, uh, Rod were able to do, you know, and I thought I'd seen everything from a car show perspective. And I went to Luft, I don't know, was that six or whatever? Was and six, I was like, I like the emoji times a thousand, right? And it was just like, wow, this is so amazing, you know? It, for, for a curated event, I, they, I went to the Luft GB, um, mm -hmm. Jesus, almost two years ago now, at a place called Bista Heritage, which is a, a wonderful place in the UK. If you do manage to come over uh, to the UK, uh, you've got to go time it with an event because it is, it's, it's brilliant. Um, very typically British, dare I say. So okay. you feel like you're, you're an extra in a, a period drama. <laughs> um, but 
I remember the, the feeling I had when you're walking around, everything has been curated. There was no car just placed off the cuff. Like, yeah, go yeah. there, go there. Everything was placed in, a, a, well, a, a story to tell. A friend of mine, Hard Park, is 964, like mm -hmm. nose, face, it's somewhere and just left it. And I, I walked past it and I was thinking, that's Matt's 964. It looks, it shouldn't be there. It wasn't supposed to be there, but you know, feck it. Uh, but everything else was just placed in the right yeah. place. And it, yeah. from videos I saw of Luft 6, it was exactly the same, but, but albeit better, you, you kind of, you're walking around and it looks like, hang about, isn't that Back to the Future there? But right. there's a portion right, there right. instead. Oh my God. Yeah, and I think a lot of that has to do with, with Swart, right? And how intentional he is, which is, it's like watching a, a, an artist in real life. And he's very thoughtful about the picture, the, the Instagram frame and, and when they place cars, which is pretty cool. I mean, I haven't, in regards to the UK, there's definitely events I want to go to, like uh, Festival of Speed or uh, the reunion, the Goodwood reunion. And, and I haven't been to the UK since... Wow, 2003 maybe. There was a Hot Import Nights that was there. Yeah, and I remember gone. That. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, where was what part of the uh, of London it was? I can't remember. It was close to Knightsbridge, and then I had gone uh, to the Max Power live events. I'm I was going to say Max Power stuff now. Yeah, See, like this, the this is... I think it was called Max Power Live in Birmingham. Max Power Live, and it was Birmingham yeah. at the NEC. Mm -hmm. yeah. At the NEC, so that's. About the last time that I went to the UK, I've got really great coworkers uh, at McGuire's UK, of course. They Dale. do a pretty rad raid. Yeah, Dale and, and Tom, and, and they do a pretty rad barbecue at our facility there. So I've been trying to find an excuse to get there. Predominantly for Festival of Speed would be the first one I want to go to. Um, yeah. But, you know, we, we just formed a partnership with Luth this year, and I know they do stuff in the, in the U.S. So that, that, I'm hoping that's one of the excuses that I can use to get out there when travel is okay again. And we also just formed the relationship with Triple Zero, and I know they do their their uh, Rare Shades event. And uh, I've been talking to Peter about, you know, where else they're going to do that stuff. So, so I'm trying to find ways, you know, to to, to get to other events outside of the U.S. because I just I love seeing the culture and the world and other in other areas and, and seeing, um, you know, what people are doing. You know, I used to do that when when I was younger and as a consultant, I went to the Aston Motor Show, Tuning World, Boat and Zay. Tokyo Auto Salon I've been to like 15 times. So, um, so it's been, it, it was, uh, it was always insp inspirational for me to, to get to those other events and really check them out. Uh, tuning. Let's talk about TAS actually, because it's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Your first, your first time at TAS, uh, what was it? 98? Let's see. And, nah, 97. Cause, 97. Cause super street, super street came out. October 96, I, uh, I had graduated high school in 95, and I had a deal with my parents where if I graduated top of my class, they would get me a plane ticket to Japan uh, to go to Tokyo Auto Salon, I'd pay for the rest. So I was lucky enough that I was able to do that. And I remember being in the editor's office, Matt Pearson, and I said, Matt, if you want a legit magazine that covers Japanese tuning, like you've got to go to Tokyo Auto Salon, I'm going to go. And he's like, RJ, I don't have a budget for that, but do you mind taking photos and writing a story? And I was an engineering student at the time. I'm like, man, I'm an engineering student. And he's like, you know, I know you're a starving student, so at least I'll, let me pay for your film. And so he paid for my film, and it, I, I came back, and it was slide film. You know, there was no digital cameras at the time because of 97. And it was halfway decent, so we decided to run an article. And he's like, can you write an article? I'm like, Matt, let me reiterate. I'm an engineering student. And he's like, RJ, this is why we have copy editors for, man. If it sucks, we'll make it better. And so I, that, was my, uh, that was my first article. And that was my first time in, in, out of the country outside of coming from the Philippines to move here to the U.S. Hmm. Um, and, you know, experiencing kind of like Japanese tuning culture for the first time. It was crazy. It was, I'm like, I had gone with a group of friends. I even had people that called me that I didn't know. They're like, hey, I heard you're going to Japan. You're going with a group. Can I come? I said, sure. You know, Sean Carlson was one of them, a famous um, fabricator and, and tube chassis builder who was also a writer for Turbo Mag. And I remember we got out the airport and we like f freaked out in the parking lot of the airport, which is about two hours from Japan, just because we saw a skyline in real life and we'd never s seen one. <laughs> um, and then by everyone, the end of Auto Everyone Salon, remembers their first skyline, man. Yeah, everyone you remembers know. their first skyline, yeah. And then by the end of the show, we're walking by it like, yeah, that one's okay. Yeah, because you get <laughs> jaded, you know. So it sucks so bad. It's like, 
Yeah, I think in the, in the Porsche world, it's like you know, if you see your first, I don't know, nine fifty nine, or, mm. or 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 even your, you know, like a like a nine eleven R or an old nine eleven R or something like this Holy Grail type of stuff. Um, you know, you're kind of like really blown away, and then if if you're like at Pebble, you know. By the third one, you're like, yeah, there's just another one. You know? <laughs> it's only worth a couple million. It's no big deal, you know. You, you say that. I mean, I, I I've come from a, a Honda and Volkswagen background, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for, in my my youth and, and growing up, and I still look at like a, a 98 spec DC2 Integra Type R, and mm. I'm like all over it. I, I you know, I had one, and I just think that's a proper car. It's wicked. And my friends are just like. But it's a Honda, and I'm like, mm -hmm. are, you, are, you, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> this is a beautiful piece. Look at those headlights. Ah, oh, it's exquisite. Right. You know, uh, and and I get what you're saying. You know, you kind of get used to it, and when it's an influx, you're at a Porsche event, and you just see all these wonderful like uh, 993 GT2s or uh, a, a 964 Carrera RS, mm -hmm. and then you're kind of like, yeah, it's another one. It's another one. It's another one. Uh, okay. Yeah, you can get kind of subsided a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, I think it's the cars that really give you a memory that stops you in your tracks, right? So whether it's something that we drove when we were young, you know, you, you, it sounds like you and I are both Honda guys. I mean, I see BZ Motos in here. Yeah, he was a Honda too. guy. Um, and now we've kind of moved on. But, you know, we still have a really special place in our heart for the things that kind of got us into cars, right? Or mm -hmm. the cars that we drove. It's exactly... You know, I look at the hot rod movement here in the U.S. and a lot of these, you know, it's these guys that were like, oh, you know, this was, this was my car in high school or this is the car that I wanted in high school or I drove in it, whatever the case may be. And for a lot of us, it's, it was a Honda, you know. And, you know, before this car, I was thinking about, like, what makes a lot of guys that were into Hondas big Porsche guys now? Yeah, and, so good question. Thank you for you know, asking the question to yourself before I ask. Yeah, because <laughs> I, was, I was like, I have to have an answer for that because I am a huge Porsche fan. I haven't owned many, but I have a lot of friends in the industry and I, I get to drive quite a few of them. Um, and I think it, it's, it's something about the engineering with Hondas and Porsches that are very s similar. There's, um, there's a simplicity to the engineering of both brands. It's not flamboyant like a Ferrari or a, lo a lot of the Italian cars. Um, and it's not boring. Like there's definitely some Japanese brands that are very boring, well engineered, but very boring. But I feel like whenever you get into a, a Porsche, it, being a Honda guy, it reminds you of a Honda that you had. So I have a great example. My, the only Porsche that I have actually kind of ever owned was a 987 Cayman uh, S uh, that I full, put a full tech R GT street kit on. Uh, with a race exhaust and whatnot. And when I had it and I co-owned it with a friend and I, I would drive it around, it reminded me of my NSX. And I had an NSX for about 12 years. The red one. Yeah. Well, I was set six different colors through the years. Um, I remember the, when it was red, at least. Yeah. Candy Apple was my favorite color. Yeah. Um, it started off red and then I just kind of got stupid. <laughs> um, but I remember yeah. having the Cayman and then driving it around and it, there was a feeling and a balance to it that was eerily similar to my NSX. And I really, really enjoyed it. And I remember thinking, there's a special soul to Porsches, 911s in particular, that reminded me something about like my love for Hondas too, which were very different. Because you can get into other high-end sports cars. And, and I love you know some of the other stuff too, but it just wasn't the same, right? Um, so I think it's, it's that simplicity in engineering and style. I mean, you know, people that love 911s, they love the design and whatnot, but it's not the most flamboyant or flashy by any means, right? I mean, I think Hondas were very much in the same way, you know? It wasn't, they weren't, I mean, outside of the NSX, you know, uh, most of the stuff that you, we, you and I grew up with, you know, DC, Integ DC Integris, DA Integris, EG, um, yeah. EK Civics, things of that nature, I think. To me, that's where this, and correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like that's where a lot of the similarities, and I think there's so many air-cooled guys that I know that are still have a CRX on the side, like all the guys at Sleepers, and uh, you know, guys, even guys that have a, a lot of the 991 stuff, like Chris Pepper, and um, you know, they're, they're all Honda guys too, which is an interesting kind of dynamic. I mean, Busy Moto's in here. We can ask him, because he's still huge into to both of it as well. Of course. Um, and it's just interesting to see that progression and evolution and 
I think part of it is for the 9-11, it's always been an evolution and never a revolution, right? Like when you talk F1 cars, it's like yeah. either evolution or, or, a, or a revolution. And I think there's something familiar about 9-11s from, was it 63 when they first came out to, to now that, that there's, there's still a, a tie and a continuity. And I think with Han, is that there was always that too in the 90s for us, right? There was always this tie and this continuity uh, yeah. as, as it went from one generation let's call it motor right from the zc to the 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 the, the, the b series to the h series to the the k series you know um and then we th think about porsche motors and that flat for you know that flat boxer style engine it's still pretty much the same yeah so i think that's you know there's that familiarity that i think kind of bridges and it kind of feels familiar so sorry for that long rant so no 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 you know you, you hit on so many key things and i think something that I've always felt about Honda and even Porsche. You don't have to be in the, you know, in a GT3 or a GT2 911 to appreciate how good a 911 is. You know, my Carrera 2, it's a 3.4 litre cable throttle. And what I love about it is how it feels to drive. Uh, I'm, I'm a very kinesthetic person. Mm -hmm. And the first car it reminded me of when I started driving it was, in fact, my DC2. Mm -hmm. um, and and it gets you know whenever I say that they build the connection between it people look at me like but totally different drive. cars right <laughs> yeah of course but in, in certain yeah. ways but you know there was a simplicity like you mentioned with the DC two that I thought you 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 had this bit of a dead spot around about dead center of the steering wheel maybe a couple of degrees left and right but after mm -hmm. that it was an absolute scythe you know you could really cut through corners the thing didn't feel like a front wheel drive car if anything it felt like the pivot was was closer to the center of the vehicle um you know you could really push it and the car would want you to push it my 911 um i've got michelin pilot sport four tires all around um and i've i've driven it pretty ham-fisted i must admit but at the same time it hasn't wanted to kick me out yet you know if anything i can feel everything going on underneath me i feel there's a lightness in the steering but it doesn't feel like i'm unsafe it just feels like oh okay this i'm now at the sweet spot where i can if i wanted to if i had a little bit more confidence in it get the back end out of it you know could use it to to make more progress have a bit more fun um and i kind of i kind of i've missed having my, my old dc2 that car was amazing but I kind of have, have my, I can have my cake and eat it now with 911, with the 996. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's a beautiful piece of kit. Um, it's just, it, like you say, there's so many people that still have their old CRXs or, uh, you know, uh, an old EG6 or, uh, uh, or EK or something along those lines, as well as, you know, a 911 or a Porsche of some kind. Um, I don't know if it's uh, an America only thing. Uh, I think I've seen a couple of UK people. They seem to love, yeah, I love Hondas. Plus, I love Porsches. A friend of mine, right. uh, Dave Watson, he's got an S2000 um, and he's had that for some time, but I can almost guarantee that he'll fall in love with the Porsche the first time he drives one. So. Yeah, the, you know, the S2000 is a really special one, you know, not only for the RPM, but for the gearbox. I thought that was one of the most beautiful gearboxes and smoothest yes. gearboxes. And the Cayman had the same, that gearbox in that Cayman that I had was very similar. It was very precise, but not overly precise where it was, it was tough to get into gear, but it just gave you a certain sensation that, um, that was just thrilling, you know? Like I always say, like certain cars, like stir the driving soul and make it smile. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that has to do with the steering feel, of course. And then I think the other part of that is the gearbox, you know? And, yeah. and I think it's why we still love the three pedals, not so much because of the third pedal, but more about like how you can kind of shift in and out of gear, right? And really have that connection with that car. So um, yeah, I, th I think you're, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon to me. Like, I, you know, there was a Porsche week here in LA uh, right before all the, the COVID stuff and, I ran into that's where I met Drew from from Cool, and I had seen a lot of his work and just other guys. I mean, Lanny from Sleepers is an old friend, but yeah, it was it was it reminded me of the the movement in the '90s and how everyone was just part of this movement. And not that the Porsche movement's new; it's been going on for for quite a while. But there's definitely a somewhat new movement of guys, you know, let's not rest like let's call it resto modding Porsches in in a way that's 
probably a little bit different than, you know, the classic like rest restoration style. Yeah. And to me, it's, it's really interesting to see the kind of, you know, the merging of um, this kind of different mindset with, with, with air cooled Porsches, you know, and I think the sleepers guys is, is a really great example of, of, you know, how that's being done. Right. And, and even like some of the outlaw style Porsches and, and of course, Magnus and what he's doing, but, you know, it's just a little bit of a different take, a kind of a rebel take again, you know, kind of like a, a bunch of us kids kind of screwing up Hondas back in the nineties. And now a bunch of us, not adults, adults, but not kids anymore, like no. screwing up air cooled Porsches, you know, <laughs> um, or, or in their, and water cooled Porsches too, because everyone's kind of taking their whatever GT3 or GT3 RS and putting the BBS wheels and the, uh, and the cup kit on it and whatnot. And, um, the loudest exhaust in the world. I mean, I once went on a cruise with a guy that had the full Acropovic like header, no cat. I mean, I thought it was, a, you know, like a GT3 car on the street. And I was like, so like, holy, so it sounded beautiful, but it's like, how do you not get pulled over in this? And like, it's like I was 16 again, you know, like the exhaust <laughs> was so loud. It's 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 you you strike a very good point there actually there i've i've mentioned this before and it's something i i sort of agree with i heard it on a there's a, a podcast called Picar talk that's run by two guys mike and aaron and mike mentioned a long time ago that there has been a change of the guard almost you know when you think about it like you say the porsche scene has been around for for years they've they've kind of had their been their their own thing since even the start with the 356s and, and then the 911s and then everything later on and with that the change has has occurred because people like our age group you know um i'm not far off from you now um with my age and we've we've been fortunate to come into money work hard get to where we are and then we can afford finer things in life and, and sort of thing we tend to find ourselves in a really expensive performance and cars, be it an NSX, be it, uh, you know, a, a, a really fast M3, be it a, uh, a Porsche um, and our sensibilities of what to do to liberally fuck up our cars remains the same. And we kind of imprint that onto this metal and and still enjoy it and there's so many people like us doing the same things yeah so you know it, it, it's kind of it's a continuation of the story it's almost like the original star wars uh <laughs> the, the 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 original films mm -hmm. we left the prequels out but now <laughs> <the flavor. laughs> we're right. kind of here 30 years on with our millennium falcon saying yeah we're back you know or some of us didn't even talking leave. About it, man. Yeah, no, I don't think I don't. I always say once it's in the blood, it's impossible to get it out. Um, you know, things will change it. Having kids and, and maybe the amount until they get older uh, <laughs> might change it unless you have a money tree. Like it, someone says they have a money tree. Landis, Landis. I don't know um, if, I, if I could borrow your money tree. I'd love to. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think Fair that's the only thing like things kind of change the, the priorities in life. I'm like, I'm not married. I don't have kids. So I can waste a little bit more on cars um, than if I, if, I was, if I was married or had kids, um, unless I find a sugar mama. So that, that's always, there's always that as well. <laughs> but yeah, I don't, I, I, don't, I don't think we've ever kind of left, uh, you know, because it, I think there's just so much great memories. I don't know about you, like just you know, this whole community, whether it's the, the Porsche community, the Honda community, let's just call it the car community. Mm -hmm. There's an interesting, like, bond that you just form with people that it's hard to get away from, you know, uh, once you've been around it and, and you've grown in it. Like, your best friend, my best friends are friends that I've had 20, 30 years ago. I mean, John, you know, John Sabal, and when, when he did his 964 RWB build, like, I remember shooting one of John's Hammond – BMWs like in I don't know what it must have been like 2001 and and we're still best buds you know so um yeah I think it's I think that's what really draws us right of course the, the passion for cars and and and, the, and driving them and the, but beyond that it's really you know as, as, as cheesy as the Fast and the Furious as it talks about family like it kind of feels like we're always around family you know that's why the thing that's killing me the most is not being able to go to a cars and coffee on a Saturday because that's every sat was every saturday for me you know whether it's period correct or whatever else was local to me the pec one or something like that so 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of, I'm kind of a Jones into like, go, 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 go to, go to a cars and coffee or, you know, I'm hoping at some point, hopefully before this year is over, we can do that again. Yeah. It's, it's scary to think that there's, there's a strong chance that we may not be doing anything like that for, for the foreseeable. And, uh, you know, I've got a nine six that I'm using as much as I can to go to the shops in the UK where we're kind of really locked down. Uh, it's just very strange that my drive, normally it's like three miles, but for some reason I have this really weird detour that takes me about mm -hmm. 15 miles away and then back. And, <laughs> um, and uh, I managed to, to then get the shopping. And, and again, it's the same sort of journey back. I don't, I don't get it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's trying times, I suppose, in that sense, but you're right. You know, um, I have some of my, the best memories I have growing up and, and being able to mess around with cars, you know, it is just that playing around with vehicles, um, and the friends that I've made, uh, through it. And it, it's, it's funny. I've, I've kind of continued on with a lot of those friends. We still keep in contact, but since moving into Porsche circles, money, Although the money changes, the sentiment and the mentality of the people does not. And there's some incredibly warm people that mm -hmm. I've found. Like, like, let's talk about Drew again, you know, who I met in Miami after speaking to him on the internet for about only a year. But again, like a, like a family, like an old friend. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he kind of uh, typifies for me the Porsche community at large, uh, especially nowadays, our age group, just chill, wanting to do the same thing, loving cars, enjoying life um maybe hiding a lot of spending from partners um <laughs> you, you got to um yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned about fast and furious and that i remember when I, I i saw that and then i there was a piece in max power it it came out in the uk in september 2001 Okay. And I remember Max Power did this huge spread and you were involved in that spread as well because I think mm -hmm. there was a picture of you with the four hero cars, including the Momo livery uh, mm. DC2. DC2, uh, yeah. Yep. yeah. Um, and I remember thinking, that's so cool. And you and Craig Lieberman, he, he featured in it very briefly. You just see his hand, uh, you know, at the uh, race wars meet. Mm -hmm. uh, but you obviously had the damn that's fast uh, line, which uh, you know i still get residuals so i'm blaming. <laughs> <laughs> i can't believe that i worked 19 years ago and every quarter i still get like a little check you know i'm a sneakerhead so it pays for a pair of sneakers i'm a foodie so it pays Jesus for a nice yeah. meal so if, but if yeah if you want I mean, to see some really cool like nikes just just please go on our <laughs> uh, instagram page because the guy spends a lot of money yeah, yeah, I try to be good <laughs> about it. You know, I try to find deals. I'm not super great. And, and luckily, I've been in, I, you know, one of my first jobs was working at Foot Locker. Um, oh. So I still have friends in the, that sometimes can get it to me at retail. I hate paying resale for it, but there's some pairs you just love that you're like, okay, fine. So, yeah. but yeah, the, the movie, you know, 2000 was when we filmed it. Uh, when I first heard about it, Craig was hired on as a consultant, the first consultant. I was, one of two, I was the second one on. And I remember when it first came to me, it was one of those, like, I didn't think it was serious. I thought, it's like, this can't be serious. Like how, I don't believe that a studio, you know, a motion picture studio is going to make a film with, with, um, you know, tuner cars in it. And I thought it was going straight to DVD. I literally asked the, the producers, like, this is going straight to DVD, right? And they're like, no, 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 we're serious. <laughs> and I'm like, nah. <laughs> uh, and we made the film, and no one gave a shit about it when we, when we were making. We had to beg people for parts. Um, we rented all the hero cars um, because we couldn't really afford to, to buy and remake it. Of course, we bought doubles for the stunts and stuff for certain ones. And then the movie came out and it was huge. And then, and then all of a sudden everyone gave a shit about the movie and all the things we got wrong. And I remember having to tell everyone, it's like, guys, this is a movie. It's not a documentary. And two, they never really listened to us. Like everything they said was like, hey, RJ, is this kind of possible? Or, or it's a Craig, you know, like the four-way drag race. Like, hey, do you guys race four wide at street races? Like, no. Is it possible? I'm like, yeah, I mean, in Ontario, it's an industrial park. I guess you could race four wide. <laughs> you know? So it's theoretically possible. Yeah, yeah, I guess, you know. And then, and like, funny, you know, like, whatever it was, like, eight years later, I'm watching NHRA, and they have a four-way, you know, four-wide drag, like, strip. And I, yeah. it, like, blew my mind that, that, that there was that 360 of, like, things that were, like, 
so never like in my mind like that's the stupidest thing ever and then all of a sudden it became reality you know and we got so many things wrong in the first movie one of the funniest things that people don't know about and i'll get to the video game one because that's another one too yes they basically had craig and i like list out a bunch of like brands and terms and they would just pick stuff and put it together you know like spoon engines with t66 turbos like you would never do that but like they're like it's theoretically possible. I'm like, yeah, but you'd blow that shit up. Uh. And even like the, the nitrous, you know, like with, with Paul's car or the eclipse and the danger to the manifold. They're like, RJ, um, do you guys control nitrous with, with, with uh, laptops? I'm like, ah, you can run like a two state. We were at the time we were screwing around with DFI and, and a tech two like engine management systems. And a couple of guys were running multi-stage nitrous, you know, I'm like, yeah, theoretically you could do that. And they're like, well, can you show it on a screen? I'm like, only if you're on the dyno you're like well what if you're racing i'm like mm, i mean theoretically you know and it was like okay we're just gonna you do it. sold your soul man i know <laughs> i know it was so bad i mean i did get a pretty bad rap because cause again like it was just fun in games and we were making it and it became so big afterwards that everyone was like oh rj like you and craig effed it all up because like i'm like like motec system exhaust or uh Motec exhaust system yeah, yeah. everyone's like how could how could you get that wrong i'm like well number one all paul forgot was the word and because it was Motec and exhaust system yeah and we weren't gonna go back and like re-edit it for the sake of like this person you know because i was like i would sit and stuff and i'm like oh that's completely wrong they're like rj we're not gonna reshoot that like 99 percent of the people aren't gonna get it and i was like well i kind of get it you know and it's like well it doesn't matter right and i was like oh you know i kind of walk away like I did sell my soul to it in, in a bit. And, and even my car, the S2000, that was the lead villain's car. And we, they, put yeah. Ninja Star, they put Ninja Stars on it, for God's sakes, you know, which we called Snowflakes in Super Street. It's like, could you get any more stereotypical? Like the Asian <laughs> bad guy with well, you know, a car with Ninja Stars on it. Like, really? That's the like, thing. <laughs> You're from the Philippines, but you had a Japanese surname, you know, and I was thinking... I don't understand the correlation, you know. Yamamoto, I think, wasn't it? Yamamoto? Uh, Danny Yamato. Yeah, no, Yamato. It, was just a, it was just a character. I mean, I, I landed in the film out of kind of sheer dumb luck, and someone's asking um, a project called Redline. So the movie was called yeah. Redline initially, um, the initial script that I read. And I still have it. I still have a copy of that initial script. Um, wow. But I luckily landed in the film because I was a consultant. I was hanging out on set. I became really good friends with the director, Rob, and and Paul Walker, and yeah. I had ended up in an Arco Gash commercial randomly, um, and it aired right as we were doing pre-production and starting some of the filming, and Paul Walker saw it, and he was like, hey, RJ, why don't you tell anyone you're an actor? And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, Paul. I'm not an actor. I'm not that head caught shot. I don't go to auditions. They're like, this is you in this in this gas commercial. I'm like, oh, yeah, I landed this thing. And he's like, <laughs> I'm like, why does it matter? He's like, Rob's going to call you. Rob's the director. Rob calls me and says, hey, R RJ, I thought, we were, I thought we were boys. I thought we were fam. I'm like, Paul said the same thing. And I was like, Rob, what's up, man? And he's like, Paul just showed me this thing. Like, how can you tell anyone you're an actor? I'm like, I'm not an actor. I'm like, why does it matter? Like, are you going to give me a role or something? He's like, RJ, there's characters in the film that are Asian. If you want a role, all you have to do is like, say you want a role. Cause evidently you can be in front of the camera. I'm like, all right, cool. I'll take a role. You know, like, why not? <laughs> so I ended up with that role, right? Danny Amato. And, and, and it was, I didn't, I didn't understand how I had read the script, but I didn't really, I remember like, Oh, we're going to give you this role, this Danny guy. And I'm like, all right, cool, whatever. And then I remember getting to the set for that shooting that sequence. I was like, Oh yeah, I'm one of the main four racers. Um, and so it was just cool. You know, I, I was really bummed that I drove a white civic instead of one of my real cars. Because the S two thousand was already uh, casted for for the lead villain, I had an NSX that I wanted to put in it that was supposed to be um, Vin Diesel's car, but we couldn't afford to buy extra ones to crash, so we ended up with the RX seven instead. Yeah. And they were like, "You can't drive your NSX against the RX seven; that wouldn't make any sense." And so I ended up in this white Civic that was, you know, sadly just a movie prop car. It was like a one point five liter like automatic. So. LSI. Yeah, so, but yeah, I, got, I had my, my two lines, my two seconds of fame that I still get residuals for. Here we go, and, uh, Forbes Aaron claiming, you know, damn, that guy's fast. Yeah, 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 there, yeah. yeah there that's, that's goes, the line. You know? And then, um, of course, being immortalized as like the worst Gran Turismo player of all time, you know. 
why did they cut that <laughs> into that? You oh. so so it was it was a, a form of comic relief for the director. And when we film, so the sequence of the crash, I wasn't even there when they filmed that. But they're you know because we start everything on green screen. Yeah. And the funny thing is, you know, that car, the 3000 GT and that track are the first two things you can choose on Gran Turismo. So, of course, they're like, we got to film this sequence where, you know, RJ's character crashes. So they just jumped on and we're like, just turn right into the, into the high speed bank. And I'm like, that is like the worst place. And so, <laughs> you know, my, I actually knew Kazunori um, and the producers of Gran Turismo in the oh, U.S. Wow. Um, I had... Um, tagged along when they mapped out Laguna Seca and Sears Point for Gran Turismo 3. Yeah. But there were friends of mine and they were like, RJM, um, we're really disappointed in you. <laughs> like, don't you have a game? <laughs> I'm like, uh, yeah, I do. And that really wasn't me playing, but it, you know, it was too late. It was like, RJ, this is, this is who you are. This is who your character is. You're literally like the, the worst player of Gran Turismo, like Immortalized. And there was a meme that came out like a few years ago that was like, 18 years later and this guy still doesn't know how to play Gran Turismo. And it's like, <laughs> that's going to be what it is, you know? Um, so Forever that's kind of the, the, the background on that. And uh, I'm never going to li live it down. It's okay. You know, it is what it is. I'm so. sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sorry for myself. I watch the sequence now and I watch the comments and everyone's like, how can you even crash here? I'm like, easy. You turn to the right and you turn into the wall. <laughs> you know, it's not that hard. Um, even yeah, easier, someone plays as you. And then they do that, you know. Yeah. So, so yeah. You know. Hey. You know. I, I keep buying sneakers with the residuals, so I'm just, I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm just gonna own it and, and, and lean into the, to the shame of, of being that the, the worst guy ever to play that game on, in a, in a movie sequence. So, you know. Yeah, but it was great. I mean, I'm, I can't believe they're, in, they're making, they already made nine, and I guess they, they, uh, they postponed the release, mm -hmm. and um, you know, they're, they're all signed on to ten before Paul died. He had told me that, you know, they were all signed on to 10 and they're trying to find a way to, to bring the new generation because it's Universal's highest grossing franchise in the history of, their, of the studio, right? So they really want to keep it going. And of course, they did the spinoff with The Rock and, and uh, Stratham, you know, the Hobbs and Shaw one. Um, but it's moving away from, and a long time ago, it moved away from being a car movie into more of a, you know, Italian job, FBI agent, secret agent, crazy yeah. But, you know, it'd be interesting. Is I'd love to see them make 10, you know, kind of bring it back to its roots, if that's even possible. Um, there have been some really cool cars. I know a couple, you know, through the years, I mean, I stopped working on it after the first one, but there were true blue car guys and, and for, for the cars that got brought onto the movie. So through the movies, you saw, like, really cool cars um, that you knew was, were chosen by car people. Mm. Um, but it's not a car movie anymore, you know? No, so... No. It, you know, it's, it's kind of, of it's, it's more of a story. Yeah, it's, 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 it's an ensemble movie. It's, it's really like, you know, uh, Ocean Eleven that continues on, right? Just, you know, and they kind of force the car sequences now, which kind of sucks. Um, because it's a, you could tell it's like, uh, that's, you know, you know, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But it's still in there, you know. So when did you first hear about the movie project? Yeah, 99. Because we shot it in 2000. So I think pre-production started in, in 99. And we started to gather cars together. You know, Craig and I, our main deal was to help choose the cars for the characters and then, you know, um, organize these kind of casting calls for the cars because we knew we were going to rent them. And so there's a lot of backstory in which, you know, my S2000 shouldn't have been the villain's car. It was actually supposed to be John Sabal's full Haman um, uh, Z3 Roadster, but we knew we couldn't really get the wow. kits and and all that. Um, Vins should have, should have been in my NSX, but NSX, it was yeah. a Comtech wide body and, you know, it just didn't make sense, you know, and we knew the Valeside guys would throw down kits for it. So we ended up um, with Keith Emoto's um, RX-7, which looked, it didn't even look like his car by the time the set designers were done with the paint job and, you know, Valeside threw down a different kit for it and different wheels. Mm. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's things like that through the movie that's, Craig talks a lot about in all his different videos on YouTube yeah. um, and the book that he wrote. So it was, for me, it's, there's definitely a sense of pride being a part of, you know, that fr franchise and seeing what it's become. And then for, for me, it was my calling card that really drove my career as a consultant for a long time. And, and it's why I worked on Forza Motorsport, you know, uh, and was kind of a part of that in the beginning. And it was weird because of being a really big friends with the GT guys it was a little bit awkward, but, 
but yeah, the, the Microsoft guys are really interested in, in, in bringing in a little bit of tuning culture in Forza uh, 2 Horizon. and 3. Yeah. So I started to choose like yeah. specialty cars that you could win, different wheels and kits that you could put on different cars. Um, so there's some odd cars in Forza that were like, oh yeah, that was definitely RJ. Like Vels- Veilside Drag Supra, like, what the hell? Like, yes. you know, how, you know, you know, that like, was how's awesome. that get in there? You know, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, HKS Drift S15, like, who the hell recommended that? Like, hold on a second. Um, so that was all you who 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 made these special tuna cars? Well, they were out there, and I just recommended to Microsoft yeah. that we should put these, we should make these as special cars in the game, or put these wheel companies in the game. Um, you know, and it's, it was just my world, right? I was traveling in Japan. Um, I knew a lot of these guys. I was consulting for a lot of them with their U.S. sides of the business. And I was working for Super Street, so I knew, like, everything that was everything. And I was also a big Euro fan, so the stuff that was coming out of uh, Germany with AC Snitzer and Tech Art and Brabus and all of those things, I was just a fan of everything automotive. So for Forza, mostly, too, when, when the tuning stuff really became a part of it, I was a big component to, like, recommending a lot of that stuff. And then, of course, like three and four got into like deliveries and stuff. And so they kind of went in a different direction. But if you play it now, you can still get Roja wheels. Yeah. That's my I, wheel line. That was your uh, wheel line that you created. Yes. Yeah, so of, I I, of course, I put it in there, right? So now, even though the wheel line doesn't exist, I, you know, people are still like, hey, I can still choose your wheel line. I'm like, yes, it's immortalized forever. Forever, man. Um, and Motegi so yeah, wheels, I mean, you know. Yeah, Motegi, I was a part of. It wasn't mine, but I helped create it, which led to the Roja deal. And so I have all these stories of little parts of being a part of, you know, even the drift stuff. Um, I did some die cast toy stuff early on. Um, and it's, it's cool to see how it's evolved and how I had a little piece of, 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 of it coming to be, even though most people don't know that. Right. And, and it's just for me, like a real sense of pride for sure, because, you know, I'm just the guy that wants more people to love cars, you know? Um, and, and everything that I do is, is all about that, like sharing that, that love and, and hopefully making sure it doesn't die, right? Because, you know, look, look at the kids of today and it's interesting to me, like, what would be the cars of the, of, that they dream about? Like, for me, I had, someone was talking about this the other day, like, kids don't have posters of cars anymore. I think we all did. Like, we had the famous garage with the F40 and the Kunchash and all that stuff. Yeah. And, and then all the stuff that came in the 90s, like the GT1 Porsche, the Enzo Ferrari, the whatever, you know, the CLK, the, the Mercedes Benz CLK, you know, uh, CLK GTR. Um, and so what, it, what is it for these kids? Now, I think now it's all video games, right? Everyone's playing CSR racing. They're playing Forza, Forza Horizon, Gran Turismo, yeah. um, Need for Speed. And there's new guys, hopefully, like building that inspiration. Guys like, um, you know, Kaiza in the UK and Sabal and, some of the designers out there um, that are really kind of, you know, inspiring kids in a different way um, through gaming, through 3D illustrations, which is just way different. And even what like Drew is doing, you know, and guys that are creating content that's, um, that's way different from what you and I grew up with, with Max Power and Super Street and Option mm-hmm. Magazine and all that Option. stuff, right? So... Yeah, it's 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 funny because you know print media now is is kind of changing again. You know, Super Street mm-hmm. is, is it doesn't exist, and and you have um, you know even some Jap- uh, Japanese car magazines. I found out this week that Banzai, the Jap- uh, UK mm-hmm. Japanese car magazine, is, is ceased. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the print media scene is is changing massively, and you know we have so much information that's readily available from YouTube, from, from Google, you know, right. from, from everything, which is, you know, it's, it's a shame. You know, I, I, I remember growing up as a child, you know, sorry, as a, as a teenager, even like your age, I was 14. I was about 13 when I remember picking up Max Power and, and, and reading it cover to cover, just thinking, mm-hmm. my God, I could actually do that to a Honda. Yeah. I'm gonna do that, <laughs> you know. well, uh, um, and Fly was really the main person that got, all that of guy those. was busy. Yeah, he was, he, he was in the, we hung out all the time and I learned a lot of my photography chops from him and this guy, Wesley Alice in the shop, shop for Super Street, but there was no internet at the time. So the way we shared information was we would all, as editors, we would fly to different places and meet each other. So mm-hmm. either fly from 
you know, Max Power and then, and then me and a couple of guys from the U.S. for Super Street and Turbo and Sport Compact Car to some of the guys in Australia and some of the stuff that was going on out there. And, and even some of the stuff, you know, GTI mag and um, what was the other mags in the U.K.? Fa was it Fast Forward or something like that? And, and there Red was Line. Fast Forward. There was Red Line. There was Fast Car. Fast Car. Fast business. Car. Yeah, fast yeah. Cars, fast the car. big one. Um, and that's that they, they've done brilliant because they, they've managed to sort of switch on the uh, online element and they've got like 300,000 followers if, if not yeah more. and, you know, and look, look at super much. street right they have three million on their ig oh. and another three million on facebook so you know to me it's it's a real it's going to be a real challenge but it could be really exciting too and then on the flip side look at what triple zero has done and magneto is another great one right yeah, where they're creating these wild you know, duck and whale, there's creating these really cool coffee table books that are more collectible. And so to me, that's the future of print, right? You know, like, you know, more in there's, it's funny how long form story is coming back into vogue and you're not going to do that through your iPhone because it's just, you know, like a, a, a 3000 word story. You, you, you kind of do want it in print and you do expect better paper and better photography. Mm. Um, and so I think it's going to evolve. It's very sad that we're going to lose a lot of the print mags and what we knew it, like a 12 time, 10 time a year. But I'm really excited, you know, at what Peter has done as, as a model for triple zero. Um, and I saw it a lot in some of the fashion books because I'm a big sneakerhead, like hype beast. And, and um, um, uh, there's a couple other ones that, that do it in that style. And even Hodinkee is a big watch guy. too. Oh, I think he's great. And what they've done, they, they were online first, and now they're doing print. Um, High Snobiety is another one in the fashion world. And so it'll be interesting to me if, if any of these automotive ones that were started as online ended up becoming like a quarterly print mag. Um, and I think, you know, Triple Zero and watching them do what they do, it's, it's really interesting. This merging of events and print and digital, um, and it, it sounds like Fast Car is kind of doing the same thing. So... You know, I'm really excited about that because you can tell deeper stories. You can get more into the history of a particular car, the designer, do these interviews that are even more in-depth. And, and mm. to me, that's what's going to prolong the history, right? Because yeah. I don't think a lot of the monthly mags are – they were just featuring your, 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 your car. That, and there's always a story behind every car. But even for me as an editor, it got really difficult to tell the same story of – this guy changed his wheels and he put this intake on and he added this wing and he put this type of seat in it. But, and after, but why? why? Right. Well, yeah. and a lot of the stories became like, what was the personal tie to all these things that made this car special to this person? But I feel like there's additional things that you can add in. Stuff what the triple zero is doing is like, you know, the, in, te in, in terms of the why, like what's the real deep story of, of this designer and of this feature and, and who really worked on it. And, and so to me, like those in-depth stories are, are going to be like the archives of our, of our generation. Right. So I'm really excited for people to do that. No one's really done it in the tuning world yet. You know, imagine like someone delving into the history of the GTR and the Prince, right. The Hako and how it evolved to the 32 yes. or the 31, the 32, the 33, 34, the 35. Imagine if someone told that story, in a triple zero type of way, even the NSX, right? And, and, you know, Jew was on here and the story of Senna being a big part of that and the new one and, and how, you know, that NSX has evolved and, and the difference between the two. And I think for the Porsche side, it's been kind of going on for a while, right? I mean, Peter being at excellence and Panamera and now being the head of triple zero, he kind of had this vision and that he's kind of been doing for a while, but in, in, in the tuner side, it, it really doesn't exist, you know, or hasn't, hasn't, so I'm, I'm interested to see if someone's going to do it. Not yet. Maybe, Not maybe yet. it's something, you know, <laughs> another project for you. So. Oh, Jesus, man. Uh, I've got plenty. But yeah, to be fair, you, it, it's something that I think is, is, is bound to happen sooner rather than later. You know, there's a different, um, we are, there's no class really within uh, the Porsche scene. It's just, we all appreciate 911s. We all appreciate Porsches. We all appreciate the classics, the new stuff. So. It'd be interesting to see. Okay, we are. We don't have much time for Q and A, but I've got two questions here that okay. I'm going to ask. All right. Okay. <laughs> here we go. Uh, Sarah from LA Dismantler asks, "What do you think of the new NSX?" 
Oh, I'm really torn on the new NSX. You know, I had my first one for about 12 years. I s sadly sold it. I was super excited for the new NSX when they debuted the HSC concept. I think oh, Drew talked yeah. about this. It was uh, going to be a V10 powered new NSX. 2003? 2003? It, it was a long time ago. And I was super excited about it. And then they shelved it, right? Because there was some, you know, there was recession. They got cold feet. Then it became a V8. Then it became like a, it became all these other things. And then, and then finally they launched a current version. And I hear it drives really great. And I think it looks better than the, the, the new R8. Because to me, it ended up looking kind of R8-ish. But it's, it, to me, it's just too expensive. I think it's a great car. And I think if they would have sold it for like 130 to 150, they, they would have sold like way more than they're selling now. And there's, yes, there's a lot of technology in it. I mean, it's the only quote unquote accessible car um, that you can get this hybrid technology that you, you, you know, from a 918 or a P1 or a LaFerrari. And supposedly it has like amazing cornering ability. Um, but it's just too expensive. And Acura kind of fell out of, you know, for a long time, they didn't have a Halo vehicle. So to charge like 200K in a market where there was a lot more options, McLarens, 911 turbos, um, V10, R8s. You know, I mean, a, a Nismo GTR was 145, 50. And here you were like way more than that, right? So, so unfortunately, the new NSX kind of fell flat on its face, you know? Mm. Um, the design's still pretty cool. I mean... You know, I, you know, I still a ton of friends at Honda. And so when it came out, they were like, hey, do you want to put your name down for one? And at that time, I had my, my Gullwing SLS. And I was like, there is yeah. no oh, way I'm going to sell my Gullwing for the new NSX because it was basically the same price, you know. Um, wow. And, and I was like, nah. You know? and, and now they're, you can kind of get one for a, a decent, a, a good deal at like 120 or something. So for 120, I think it's plenty of car. Would it be the car that I buy for 120 though? I'd look at a Ferrari FF or, you know, a GT3, you know, like it's just a different. So I think they're a, li a little bit too late um, for them and a little bit too expensive. I think if it, if it was a little bit less, they would have been much more successful. So that's, that's kind of my view on the new NSX. Uh, fair play. And uh, I kind of, uh, I kind of agree with you. You know, it doesn't have this. I don't know if it's because the the hands of Senna touched the original, uh, and you don't have that kind of. Although you've got a lineage with the name, but you don't have that connection with a a, a racing driver that was yeah the, the greatest by many. And I and I know some race. I think it was Alonso or someone helped with the development, but it wasn't like a, like Senna who was so yeah. involved. And I don't know if you noticed, but it was it's Senna's death anniversary this weekend. He died. Yeah. On, May first, I actually watched the, the, the documentary because I hadn't seen it in a long time. And you know, if you ever want to go to tears as a grown man, watch the Senna documentary. Even if you're not a fan of F1, it, yeah. it it'll 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 make you weep like a little baby. You know, Thanks. there's only been two movies I've been in theaters where uh, guys have weeped like kids, and that was Senna and Fast and Furious Seven. Knowing that <laughs> oh, Paul, God, was, yeah. knowing that Paul was gone, you know, oh, like, there were so many guys like not trying to tear up I'm like it's okay man <laughs> just cry just cry <laughs> yeah i hear you man so what, i mean there's what? there's my senna oh i'm going to say right that senna isn't it yeah mm -hmm. That's beautiful man one last question and you have approximately 30 seconds to answer yeah this. before we're over <laughs> for the hour um is the 993 gt2 the ultimate the one oh I'm not a turbo guy, so I prefer GT3 over GT2. I would say the, from an air cool perspective, yeah, the GT2, because of the, the aesthetics of it, was really cool, but I still love GT3s more. Oh, jeez. Oh. Um, and so from the air cool side, there wasn't really a, was there, a, there wasn't a GT3 993. I think it was just called the Carrera RS, right? Yeah, the RS, the so, GT3 was created to for homologation purposes mm -hmm. uh for racing and then they dropped the gt3 moniker because originally they were going to call the race series gt3 and then they right. turned it to just gt so yeah no i i would stick to i would say clear rs over gt2 i mean i like the styling of the gt2 better i'm just a fan of na so and i really love 997 um 4.0 so that's like oh. one of the ultimates to me even though it's not air-cooled no, but it's still an amazing car. Yeah. Um, 
RJ, thank you so much for being on, man. I really appreciate it. You've been absolutely awesome. And uh, thank, thank you so much. All right. No, take no. care. Cheers, take man. All cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.